all there is. There's youth and there's cats. That's the first group and that's the first type of brand. Second type of brand in Indonesia is mums, okay? There's youth and there's mums. Sorry, lonely dad. You, you don't, um, you know, I'm sorry about it. It's just, it's fact, right? What are mums like? Babies, okay? So make your pick. You got cats, you got babies. Or you want to have both, all right? That was a bit of irony. What you really need to do is keep it real and think about what does your brand actually represent. If your brand was a person and it went to a party, what would they talk about, all right? And this is a very challenging thing to do. Imagine you're a bank, and now you're, you're, you're thinking, what do I talk about if I'm a bank? Banks are really boring, all right? So what am I gonna talk about? I'm really, really boring. Well, don't talk about banking, okay? Talk about money. Money, exciting, bling. Banks, boring, money, exciting. Don't talk about what you are. Talk about what you represent. What is the true essence of your brand? because that's where you can have a real conversation. That's where you can find the true, authentic voice of your brand. I think of it as brand whispering, finding out what is the true essence and expressing that. And there's one last thought I'd like to leave you with today, and that is we need to change as marketers, as this community, we need to change, and we need to stop interrupting what people are interested in, and we need to become what people are interested in. Thank you very much. Marvelous. All right. I'm reigniting an Ignite talk. This is a, a talk I did several streams ago. And based on the discussions today, I wanted to reignite the Ignite talk. Why? What's one common theme that we hear, to, hear today, or I heard? No standardized measurement in digital, right? We just don't have it. I don't know why, but we seem to not have it, which then affects ROI. So. Quite a few years ago, I was inspired by popcorn. It was a case study on popcorn, and popcorn is evil. Did you know that? I bet you didn't. There was an organization in the States. Um, they were called the, the Center for Science and the Public Interest. Very catchy name. And they basically said, why is popcorn dangerous? Because it's full of fat, right? How many grams of fat in popcorn? 37. That's a lot, but it's kind of like digital ROI, like the fragmentation of all this measurement. Nobody knows it's a lot. So this organization had to teach people that this was an incredible amount of fat. So they had a press conference, invited all the press for lunch, and they put all this food in front of them in one single plate, and they said, here's your lunch, and the press were like, what the hell? And they said, that's 37 grams of fat, and that's equal to one serving of popcorn. And they got it in a second. The press then repeated the story, and the parallel here is digital measurement, digital ROI. Let's go on a little journey. Okay, so offline, I don't think there's a problem. We have something called the GRP. We know what it is. It's standardized. We've been using it for years. Fantastic, right? Now let's take the journey to online. What measurement do we have? Take your pick. Well, let's start with the CPM. Yeah, it could be 370, that'd be a very high CPM. And that was good for a while. We had this CPM, people understood it. But the industry, the lovely industry that we're in, decided that there's another metric, the click-through rate. So then you can imagine businesses and clients, whoever, trying to say, all right, so it's now about click-through rates. What happened to the CPM? Oh, never mind, it's click-through rates. Or then we had the explosion of search, and it became about cost per click. So already three different measurements very quickly, no standardization. So we're fragmenting the industry. You know, we keep adding new methods of success. So we never know if we're succeeding or failing. Cost per acquisition. Yeah, makes a lot of sense. But it's yet another type of measurement. So you kind of get the drift, right? It's an issue. What we have to do is get back to basics. We have to get back to business basics. What are business measurements? Yeah, we can talk about engagement, you know. But at the end of the day, there's something else that we should be communicating as an industry. We should be talking about business results that every brand can understand. We should be taking a page out of the Center for Science and the Public Interest 
and saying, how can we communicate like this? How can we make sure people get it in a second, right? Make it very transparent, make it very clear. Well, every business understands these four terms, right? Leads, conversion, revenue, sales, profits, whatever. That's what we need to talk about as an industry. We have to tell people how we're improving these four metrics, and then we're going to win, we're going to make it real, we're going to have success. Thank you. <laughs> Who's next? I remember when, uh, when I was 10, I have this book about uh, logos from many of brands in the world. It, that's while my friends collecting Dragon Ball cards and Tamagotchi and, and everything, well, I'm collecting logos of brands, a bit sick. But then I found out that what makes it interesting and become my passion is that I found that the watch ads is actually pointing 10 and 10. It, they infuse this message, it's about the fee victory in World War II. They wanted to end the world. And this is Sate Klatak, this is Jogja. You can find everywhere a stage. You can find a street fender using only one sandal. Because the other sandal have to guard it so that they, the, the sand will sink the, 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 the sails. And then Guardian asks about this. When the agriculture country used, uh, can use Twitter flu fluently. Okay, give me five chance to answer the Guardian. First, uh, Bechak driver actually makes money by tweeting. Our president, they tweet and spends lots of money. That first guardian. And they follow each other, the Bechak driver and our president. Number two, not only vampires and cats, but friends, uh, ghosts in Indonesia are friends. They kind and cute, they make poetry and everything. This is ghosts in Indonesia. Number three, guardian, it's your ex can finally bullet you in Twitter. They call it tweet war. There's no pictures here, but please, no pictures allowed to take pictures on this slide, please. The next is social media drives the media mainstream. This is when this happened. Number five is you have to meet this girl, Princess Shahrini, the famous one from Indonesia. They said that uh, you have to act smart. No, that's not true. You have to be stupid, then you get genius label. <laughs> then I realized that we have to make news, not ads. Lots of good people in Indonesia, they hiding. I don't know, but there's a lot of good people. So the idea is simple. Finally, there's one idea to connect these people and good, good, uh, the unknown people connecting with the good people. They call it the Tweet Talk. Tweet Talk is a, it's a show in Twitter. Actually, they, they meet these uh, good people, not famous, and then the unknown people connect each other, talking uh, question and answers. It, it become like the first live talk show ever happened on Twitter. Every Friday, every Thursday, 9 p.m. You can check the hashtag Tweet Talk. They finally grow, become a community, and they have their own uh, radio show. They, they got exposed, they become a brand ambassador. Even the Ministry of Trade sponsored and support them making this ebook have ever happen. Uh, the Tweet Talk is simple. He, he wants to be the, they, they want to be a most weighted gig after World Cup and F1 race. When you see the World Cup, you see Tweet Talk in every screen in, I don't know, Poland, Hollywood, cafe and everything. So that's all about advertising and my passion. I see that that's chances and opportunities. Client gives the, give the opportunities, agency get the chances. So that's the story. Thank you. Uh, good evening, Jogja. How are you feeling today? I have a little presentation which is going to leave you with a thought at the end of it. The purpose of looking at the future is to disturb the present. So let's just see how much power we really have and what are we doing. You see, today this is what we can do. We pick up a tablet or a device and just think. Let me try and call someone random. And lo, behold, you can actually talk to anybody in this world. Anytime, any place. 
Now, isn't that a powerful thought? We can do this today. You could never do this some time ago. And why is that? Because this was 20 years ago. I still remember I had to queue up waiting to make a call, even if it's long distance. And I don't know how many of you, maybe this is not real for many of you. But you know, the situation was such that we could just buy a local newspaper. You had to be in the city to buy the newspaper. You could not buy the newspaper of back home if you were traveling, or of another place, or another city, or another country. And that was real. It's not so today. The high-speed internet that you have today on your phone was like this. And I don't know how many of you have seen a scene like this, but this was it. People used to gather together and see how they can connect and see what's out there in the world. So what's really happening here? 20 years ago, we needed so many gadgets. If you're gadget freaks, this is what you had to do. You needed a phone, a camera, a computer, a printer, a, uh, you know, DVDs, listen to music on a walk mode. And now we have one device. And you see how it is all converged on one device that can do all of this. Read the news, take a photo, send a message, blah, 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 blah. And every day there's a new phone coming, does even more and more and more. And of course, you also know that the future is wireless. Now you must be thinking, where am I going with all this? You know all this. This is not new. There's nothing really earth-shaking about this. But the thought that I want to leave you with is basically this. If you looked at how technology has developed, 1800 years, 340, 30, 12, 8 years, just 20 years is the world that we know of today. It's all happened in the last 20 years. So much has happened. Why is that happening? Because businesses are forced to become market disruptors. They're competing with each other. They've got to change the industry. They've got to move on, make profits. At the end of the day, there's a new device for you to buy, a new computer for you to buy, a new handphone to buy. And technology is really leapfrogging. You can't imagine the phone that you bought a year ago is already old. Six months ago, and there's a new model. There's a new feature, something waiting to be tried, and you don't have it. But you see, that's because of innovators. So what's happening in the other parts? Let's say travel. Cars are like airplanes, reality 3D tour. How about anti-gravity? Do you think that's what's coming up? Yes? What about healthcare? Do you think we'll cure all diseases and live to 120 years? How about living to 300 years? Do you think that's possible? So basically, it's all boiling down to this, that it's all in our thought. If this is the rate of change, what do you think will happen a year from now? Two years from now, five, 10, 100 years from now? A thousand years from now, what's your mobile phone going to look like? Have you ever thought of it? This is a really powerful thought, and that's all I have to do today. Thank you very much. Hi. I just realized... Huh? Oh, sorry. Hi, sorry, a little awkward. Um, I come from a different place. Um, from the rest of you guys. I basically come from the world of art, right? So um, what i like to talk about is um, how art is like in the future of digital, in humanistic sense. Um, I'm mostly a fool, right? I dream. I uh, think about stuff, I ask stupid questions. I think that's important, okay? So I did marketing for a little while. Uh, I tried lecturing, so I was the coordinator of interactive media at some art school, right? So now I am a full-time idiot. And sometimes I have the turban thing going on. Um, I'm not really a tech person, right? So what I really feel about tech is that it's kind of cool. It's very functional. I mean, you have to ask yourself the question, when has a website ever made you cry? Right. Oh my god. Um, OK, I love tech. Oh no, sorry. I don't really like tech, but I really, what I see in tech is um, what it can do. It can change so many things in an instant. Sorry, maybe I should step here. Okay. Um, okay, so what really got me started, right, uh, with the whole interactive thing, why I studied computer science after, is um, really these two people, so Diego Diaz and Clara Broch. So they basically came over, uh, they did some artwork that lets you see Wi-Fi signals in the air in real time. And that was made in Singapore. Okay. 
So a lot of things are changing now. Um, you have things that like art knows that it's art now. You know, uh, the previous one that I showed you just now is an object. You look at it, you blink, it blinks back at you. So there's so many um, kind of roots for creative expression. What you're looking at is basically um, code that kind of made um, these patterns and then the kind of printed it out in 3D. Right. Um, so you have things that are previously never ever possible. So you have uh, new identities, logos that can change over time, um, many different variations on the same theme, so on and so forth. So if, um, if you look at this, I don't know, but uh, this is the logo for the new city of Melbourne. Sorry. <laughs> 15 seconds, a little long. Um, and that goes into the rest of identity design as well. So what we're really looking at here is uh, new work by Phil. So this is for a print agent, a print shop called Pigment Po, where they basically wrote a computer program to kind of generate the identity on the fly. Okay. So new things, new uh, ways of conveying emotion, showing emotion, reflecting emotion. So what? Uh, this one is is uh, really generative faces, angry, sad. You can key in the parameters and kind of outputs every the, the rest of it. But the real question that um, I kind of want to ask is, um, can your logo be sad? And I feel that's important because social media, everything that's going on, there's feedback from customers, so on and so forth. Can your logo be uh, reflective of that? Let's say your brand is not feeling well, your brand is excited and so on. Right, can that be done? Um, so what, uh, the weekend logo is basically um, kind of experiment, so we built it as a balloon, right? So maybe follow us on Facebook, we're gonna go back and build it, and um, then you can follow us there, right? Thank you. Okay, I thought that I was after Sachi. Sachin. Well, the greatest feeling in the world, I, not knowing that the theme today, uh, the theme for this is marvelous, I should have written marvelous, but is the takeaway is I'd like to share what would be a takeaway that gives you the greatest feeling. Raden Kartini is a Javanese princess, born in 1879. Her birthday is our Emancipation Day, nationally, Indonesian. But probably she would not be happy with this result of what we did with McKinsey. Um, Indonesian women on the board level and on the CEO level is only single digit. Look at this room. How many women in this room? It's pathetic. Thank God the highest is Ranjana, it's a woman. Uh, <laughs> but we are all women as leaders in Indonesia. We are lonely. We are among the men. Um, Brazil 6%, India, and why 40% they leave the workforce at the early tenure. And when we ask further, 72% they left because of family reasons. And so we know like it is about double burden syndrome. It's the fact that they have the family responsibility, they have also office responsibility. But we can turn it around, make it positive. If we give them motivation, if we drive them, we can change the statistics. Now, Femina is 40 years managing women. We inspire them, inform them, and in give interacting with them. It's funny statistics, in 72, we have two working hours to choose. 